Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and animatronics. And you can find out more at trxdinosaurs.com. This week, we have an interview with Glenn McIntosh, who was the animation director on Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom and had a really cool role making the dinosaurs that we all saw in the movie. And we go into a lot of depth in our interview later, which oh, was yeah. a really great interview. We had a lot of fun. We also have Dinosaur of the Day Llama Ceratops and a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, we like to give big thank you to some of our patrons. And this week, we would like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Blaze Campbell, Trent Carbajal, Stefan, Nutmeg, Taya, Glenn Liddell, Dashiell Hammond, and Stego Sophie. <laughs> That's Stego Sophie just joined, so thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. We added a new perk to our Patreon, where now if you're a patron, you can see all of our Dinosaur of the Day requests, because I was going through the list the other day and we're up to like 87 or something. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a lot. Also, if you're a patron, you can request a Dinosaur of the Day um, going forward, because we have so many requests, so we want to make sure that if you're a patron, we get to your Dinosaur of the Day request. Yeah, because 80 Dinosaur of the Days means 80 weeks which is almost two years, and <laughs> they grow. They've been growing like two a day, basically, mostly on YouTube, people requesting stuff. So we, we need to restrict it to patrons just so that we can get through them. The list grows faster than we can keep up with it. Yes. So for now, we will take new requests from patrons, and we will prioritize existing patron requests, and then eventually we will work our way through the existing <laughs> list. <laughs> the massive list. Yes. And just to explain, we'll be posting on Patreon how you can get access to this list. It's going to be a page on our website, but it's password protected. So as a patron, you will have the password. Ooh, exclusive. So exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> we also have the results of our poll about whether we should get rid of our intro and outro. And it was about 60-40 in favor of getting rid of the intro and oh, outro that's music. closer than I would have guessed. I thought so too, especially with how negative we were about it on the show. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll be figuring out what to change it to and how to change it. It's likely the music will definitely change. Somebody pointed out, too, that they even heard the music somewhere else. So we really need to change that to something that's more unique to our podcast. And then we'll probably just have like a simple little bit of music in the beginning. And we might still have a pre-recorded ending just so we can put in all the same details about where to email us and all that kind of stuff. But it will definitely have different music, so it's a little less jarring because that was the main <laughs> word that we heard. So yes, that will be changing soon. We also have a correction from last week. Brett sent us a message saying that the Jurassic World Choose Your Own Adventure skill, I guess, on Alexa only costs $5 once. Oh. Last week we were saying, oh, that's super expensive. If you have to pay $5 a chapter, then it's more expensive than just about any book, and it's only six chapters long. But I guess you just pay $5 once, so then it's not too bad. Yeah, that makes it a lot more affordable. Jumping right into the dinosaur news, we've got a new sauropod. Yes. <laughs> and the title of the paper is An Early Trend Towards Gigantism in Triassic Sauropodomorph Dinosaurs, which is a pretty self-descriptive title. It was written by Cecilia Apaldetti and others in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, which I think means it's behind a paywall, but luckily I have access to that one. And the dinosaur that they named was Ingentia, which means huge. I think I'm saying that right. And then Prima for first. And they named it that because it's one of the first really big sauropods <laughs> or sauropodomorphs, depending on where you draw the line. So, oh, right. Isn't this the one that shows that gigantism may have happened twice with sauropods or something? Yeah, at least twice. I mean, we see that kind of thing in several points in time, especially in different lineages of dinosaurs, but I guess maybe just in sauropods, maybe twice. I don't know. So they showed this dinosaur as about 10 meters or 30 feet long. So it's not that giant, but compared to other Triassic dinosaurs, it was really big. So Triassic, you have to think of these little tiny early dinosaurs, mostly bipedal, 
things like Coelophysis and stuff like that. Yeah, so it wouldn't have had many predators. Yeah. The reason they think it was so big is they found part of the left shoulder all the way down through the start of the front hand slash foot, because since it's a sauropod, the hand is pretty much foot. And then they found most of the neck, including the beginnings of pneumatic fossae. In other words, it's sort of that hollowing of the bones, like the bones are being reduced to make space for stuff like air sacs and possibly lightening the load. So we're really starting to see the signs of gigantism, especially in dinosaurs, in this really early dinosaur They also found a second specimen, not the holotype, but what appears to be another individual that had more of the limb bones and also some tail vertebrae. So they have a pretty good view of what the dinosaur looked like. It was from the late Triassic, about 210 million years ago, and they found it in South America, specifically the San Juan province of Argentina. Shouldn't be too surprising it's from Argentina, especially a lot of Triassic stuff comes from South America too. They think it's closely related to Lessomsaurus, which was also about 10 meters or 30 feet long. But that one was around about 10 million years before Ingentia, based on when they said mid-Norian, and Norian is in the late Triassic from 209 to 227 million years ago. So I'm just estimating that they are saying it's about 220 million years old, which is super old because we think the very first dinosaurs were 230 to 240 million years ago. So it's really, really early, especially for something on four legs that's 30 feet long. Mm -hmm. So that was really where they spent most of the time talking about the paper. It's almost like this new dinosaur was sort of an afterthought. They were more (laughs) excited about talking about Lessomsaurus in a lot of ways. So it's a similar age, sort of. 10 million years off, and a similar place. It was one province to the north. This Lessomsaurus was found in La Rioja in Argentina. And they propose that the one that was found may have even been a juvenile with unfused vertebrae. Oh, so it could have gotten bigger. Yeah, and they think it could have weighed almost 10 tons. Wow. In the Triassic, which is just crazy. And this is 70 million years before Brachiosaurus, which is estimated in more like the 20 to 30 ton range. So really talking about a huge sauropod for such an early point in time. Because of how huge it is and how early it is, they named a new clade Lessomsauridae. And in their description of Lessomsauridae, they said it's partly because of, quote, thick zones of highly vascularized fibrolamellar bone within a cyclical growth pattern, end quote. Basically, what that means is it grew very quickly, and they even point out in the paper that the bones might have grown up to two to three times faster than other sauropods. So it's a very fast-growing sauropod. I think it worked out to being like 10 millimeters of bone diameter growth, or maybe it would be 20, because that might just be on one side of the bone, (laughs) per year. So it's like half an inch or so of bone thickening. It's like, it's a very fast-growing dinosaur. Mm -hmm. I wonder what it ate probably a lot of plants (laughs) all the time. (laughs) Maybe it didn't have that much competition. It was like an early tall dinosaur or something. They also threw in antitonitris into this Lessomsauridae group. So it's really just those three dinosaurs at this point of super fast growing Triassic sauropods, which is a pretty awesome group. I'm kind of excited about it. Kind of. <laughs> I could Come be more excited, I guess. It's okay. I'm excited enough for the both of us. If they found some like really early ankylosaur that was huge and had like mm. a club on its tail, then I'd be very excited. It's okay. But <laughs> this is where the real excitement is. I guess so. And then to your point, Sabrina, what you said earlier, they say it's the first pulse towards gigantism in dinosaurs that occurred over 30 million years before the appearance of the first eusauropods. So I think there was a second, you know, big growth in you sauropods later, Mm -hmm. but these are sauropodomorphs maybe, or just very early sauropods that had a separate sort of growth pattern going on. Yeah, sauropods are the best. They're okay. These are really cool. Best. One of the depictions of Lessomsaurus reminds me of some of the early depictions of sauropods with like spiky teeth where they're eating, they're like carnivorous. Oh, right, because it's so early. (laughs) Yeah. I don't. I think they were still herbivorous, but I, it's like the skull that they showed had such sharp teeth <laughs> and it, such like a big boxy head too, compared to later sauropods, which have kind of tiny heads. Even something like Camarasaurus. 
Yeah, still a little bit bigger, a little longer, it mm-hmm. looked like. But I couldn't find if they actually found that skull. I tried really hard to find what they actually found of the original Lessimsaurus. Mm-hmm. If they found that skull and like really know what it looks like well, or if they're just guessing based on other dinosaurs that were around at the time. And I think they might just be guessing because it's usually really hard to find sauropod skulls. Sure. So they might so, just be kind of extrapolating a Camarasaurus back or something. We're back to the need more fossils. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't. They definitely didn't find the skull for Egentia, so it's too bad. But the they did find the the long bones, as they call them, <laughs> which are super useful because then you can see how quickly they grew. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. In another part of the world, members of the Explorers Club Hong Kong chapter teamed up with paleontologists, geologists, archaeologists, and scientists to explore the Gobi Desert, which is really cool. Yeah, I didn't realize that the Explorers Club had chapters yeah. in different countries. That's interesting. So the, this was a team of about 35 people. They spent 20 days in the desert. They found around 250 new fossil locations and hundreds of bones, including some of uh, Tarbosaurus and three potential species that had not been discovered before. That's pretty good for 20 days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I remember seeing this where they say that they found 250 new fossil locations and hundreds of bones, which is such a weird combination of facts. Mm-hmm. Because you'd think if there were 250 locations, you'd have at least thousands of bones. That would only be like four per location. But I'm wondering if by location, in air quotes, it's like if you find a dinosaur bone here, and then 50 feet away, you find another dinosaur bone. They're mm-hmm. saying those are two locations. Could be. Well, they ended up taking the same route as Roy Chapman Andrews. Oh, yeah. Who did it in the 1920s. But they used satellites, drones, and thermal cameras, so obviously more technology. Also, uh, Infiniti QX50s. Oh, the SUV? Yeah. (laughs) Rather than driving around in like horse-drawn buggies or whatever. Yeah, because one of the articles I read about that, it sounded almost like an ad for... (laughs) (laughs) For Infiniti. For Infiniti, Maybe they sponsored it or something. I think they might (laughs) have. And then they had to deal with Probably similar to Roy Chapman Andrews, sandstorms, scorpions, and spiders. Oof. Yeah. So maybe you're right, maybe in terms of the locations. And it's just better known because they had this technology. Yeah, I guess. uh, Yeah, if your drone, I suppose if you're mapping it by drone, that would make perfect sense because you could cover a lot of area quickly. And then you could say like, oh, here's one, here's one, here's one. And then if there's a little cluster of them, you'd call that one location. Mm -hmm. But if they're a little farther apart, then you you'd have to mark them out separately because then you're going to walk to them. Yes. And then you'd really be aware of how different of locations they are. (laughs) Yeah. And they also found the first Velociraptor ancestor fossil at a new site and the first evidence of a meat-eating dinosaur found in that particular area. Yeah, they really threw out a lot of early non peer reviewed claims. <laughs> yeah. Like Velociraptor ancestor, new species, true, all this true. kind of stuff. So it'll be But there I were paleontologists right on the trip, so maybe they're at least able to get this preliminary idea. Yeah, but the phylogeny is a whole situation. Sure. It's not usually the kind of thing you can just look at a bone and be like, oh this looks like an ancestor to that one. Right, right. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know too many details because it was all very, it was about the excitement. Mm -hmm. I assume it's just a dromaeosaur that they found and they know it's from an earlier formation. Mm. And then they just kind of throw that out there as a sort of simplified version of what it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, now these bones are going to be analyzed and then paleontologists are going to go back to these sites so they can find more bones. Nice. Yeah, 35 people that they sent out there. That is a ton. Mm -hmm. Usually these excavation teams are like what, one to 10 sort of range, usually less than 10. (laughs) 35 is a lot. They had to carry all that equipment. I guess. No, they had their infinities. Oh, that's true. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't need to carry anything. (laughs) Now we got museum exhibit news. The Lapworth Museum of Geology at the University of Birmingham in the UK has a new exhibition from now until October 27th called Drawing Out the Dinosaurs. And this showcases the history of, quote, the drawn dinosaur, combining outdated paleo art with some of the very latest reconstructions of Mesozoic animals, end quote. So it's basically two centuries worth of art and media. It sounds wow. pretty cool. Yeah. Because you can imagine, we talk about this all the time, how our depictions of dinosaurs have changed so much. 
even in just the last 10 years. So it's cool to see it all over a 200 period span. Yeah, 200 periods. <laughs> 200 year, you know what I meant. <laughs> In Kansas City, Missouri, at Union Station, they have a new exhibit from now until January 6th called Dinosaurs Revealed. There are 26 life-size animatronic dinosaurs. They've got Ankylosaurus, T-Rex, lots more carnivores, and two skeletons, as well as some skulls. And if you visit, you can touch some. This includes touching the femur of a Camarasaurus, which is nicknamed Lyle. (laughs) I don't know the story behind that, but I like that. There's also a sandbox where you can, quote, sculpt a volcano and cause it to erupt with flowing lava through special lighting effects, end quote. (laughs) That's pretty fun. I think we've done that. We've seen those things where you sort of sculpt sand and there's a projector above it. Mm -hmm. And I think it has distance sensors and then it it shows like snow on the top of the peaks and then water in the low parts. So I'm guessing if you make it tall enough, it just turns it into a little volcano eruption. Yeah projected onto it. Yeah, those are pretty fun. Yeah, they are. So this exhibit was produced in-house and designed to be educational and entertaining, and the station worked with Gungu, a Chinese manufacturer for the animatronics, and they worked with design experts, and they also got some fossils on loan from Bruce and Judith Wake, who volunteered at the Dino Lab at Science City, and there's a T-Rex cafe that's now closed from Kansas City, Kansas, that donated the skull casts of T-Rex and Triceratops, so a lot of people coming together to make this happen pretty cool. And oh, and other fossils came from the University of Kansas Biodiversity Institute and Natural History Museum and the University of Missouri-Kansas City Department of Geosciences. It took them nine months and about $900,000 to make. So if you want to visit, tickets cost $15 if you go on a weekday and $17.95 if you go on a weekend. Cool. Yeah, $900,000. It must be good. I think my mom actually went to that and said it was really cool Mm -hmm. because she lives near Kansas City. (laughs) (laughs) And then they said, too, once this exhibit is closed, since they bought the exhibit rather than a lot of times they'll just kind of rent moving through exhibits, Mm -hmm. they'll have this exhibit that they can either put in one of their museums or sell it to another museum so it can go on permanent display somewhere. Oh, nice. Or maybe, I guess. Or it could be a traveling one. Yeah, they could also just go that route, but. Yeah, it's definitely going to be around for a little while. If you're a student in northeastern Arizona, North Pioneer College is offering a new paleontology course this fall all about dinosaurs, and it's a three-credit course. You can transfer it as a science elective into the paleontology programs at either Northern Arizona University or University of Arizona. And in the course, you learn about the origin and evolution of birds. You get to explore local rock formations, too. And it's going to be taught by biology professor David Smith and paleontologist Doug Wolf. And Wolf has been a consultant for the U.S. Geological Survey and discovered Zunoceratops Christopheri, which is the oldest ceratopsian in North America. And it was found in the Zuni Basin, and the species name is in honor of his son, Christopher. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't take any classes about dinosaurs. You audited one. I did. When you were an undergrad. That was fun. There was a lot more to it than I was expecting. (laughs) Yeah. Everybody is always surprised with how much there is to dinosaurs once you really get into it. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like that one might even... Well, if you get to explore local rock formations, that's cool. That puts a whole new perspective on it. Because the one I audited was like like an lecture hall with 300 people. Yeah very different feel. (laughs) Much more analytical than getting out there and really looking at some of the bones and stuff. Mm That would be a lot of fun. And you get college credit for it, then it's really a (laughs) win-win. Yeah. I wonder if you could take that class if you're not enrolled in a university. Um, If it's at a community college, It's community college, so you probably could. And then if you wanted to transfer the credits or whatever, you could. Yeah. But even if you're just a dinosaur enthusiast, maybe you could take it. Yes. But we don't live in Arizona, so that's the problem. That's true. Plus... (laughs) We're not great at it. It's best to leave that to the professionals. (laughs) (laughs) So we have some Jurassic Park and Jurassic World stuff to talk about. This one was great. Somebody put together clips from Jurassic Park. I think it was just the original. And it's got all the characters, including the dinosaurs, wearing high heels. Mm. It's only 21 seconds long, but... I really enjoyed watching it, and it's very easy to watch on loop. You can see Brachiosaurus in these giant zebra-striped heels. There's compies in small yellow heels, and then it ends with T-Rex in yellow polka dot heels, and it's roaring as the Jurassic Park banner falls on her, you know, that end scene. Oh, is this just a play on the fact that they're all female dinosaurs? Is that what they're going for? No, because the male characters in the movie are also wearing heels. Oh, even the humans? Yeah, all the humans. Why did they do this? Just for fun. (laughs) For laughs. (laughs) <laughs> just for the lulls. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it worked. <laughs> it's gotten a lot of views. That's good. 
<clears throat> and last, there's already speculations on what Jurassic World 3 will be like now that Fallen Kingdom's out. I guess I'm not surprised, but we're still three years away. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know if they've finalized their script yet. Mm -hmm. But according to Screen Rant, the dinosaurs should win in the final movie. Now that the dinosaurs are free, quote, the fall of the kingdom has begun and now it's time for payback. Oh, uh, so it's going to be, do you think that's why they bought, brought Jeff Goldblum back mm. to do that ominous like, I oh, told it's you Jurassic so. World. And that now it's actually going to be like what Michael Crichton always talks about with scientists gone mad destroying the world sort of thing. Could be. That's definitely one way they could go with it. That would actually be pretty satisfying if it just ended with like humanity's wiped out. It's just dinosaurs everywhere. But then how would they make another series if they decided to do that in the future? Then it's got to be like that dinosaur movie from around 2000 where it's just dinosaurs. Oh. There's no more humans. Left. Or maybe dinosaurs bring humans back from old <laughs> DNA things and then the humans <laughs> wipe out the dinosaurs. It's just this never ending <laughs> cycle. Yeah. <laughs> And there's like a Jeff Goldblum dinosaur that's like, don't bring back the humans. <laughs> don't you remember what it was like? <laughs> that would be wonderful. I feel like there is some fan fiction in there. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be fun to write. <laughs> and before we get into our interview, I quickly want to talk about Jurassic World Evolution, the game. Because even though it came out a couple weeks ago now, we were, I think flying or about to fly between some countries when it came out and we're finally settled back in the u.s so i had some time to play a game <laughs> so i played it a couple days ago and it's really fun so basically jurassic world evolution is the game that you would expect everyone to want to play who ever watched or read jurassic park because you get to make your own jurassic park and it starts with actually sending teams out into the field to collect dinosaur DNA from fossils. You have a little research team and a little helicopter flies out because it's got that overhead view of your whole park. But you don't actually really get to do any of the science of like picking out fossils or anything like that. They just show up like two minutes later with a bunch of fossils and then you click on them and you're like, okay, extract the DNA. Mm -hmm. So there isn't much to the whole like extracting DNA. They leave that purely in the realm of magic <laughs> Which might be for the best because there isn't really any real science or real way to do it anyway. It's kind of tedious. Yeah, and it, it would be. It's a little bit tedious anyway because you have to wait two minutes and you just basically are constantly sending this team back and forth to collect more and collect more because the whole goal is to get all the dinosaurs, right? Mm -hmm. And you get only little fragments of DNA from each fossil. So you have to do it lots and lots of times. It's actually, oh, that's realistic. Yeah, I, yeah, true. If we ever could do this. And it reminds me a little bit of Jurassic World Alive in that way, the mobile game, where it's like you're collecting little bits of DNA for a long time before you can actually get the dinosaur. Then once you have the dinosaur, you go to your little, I think they call it the John Hammond Creation Lab, <laughs> which is a structure that's attached to the side of one of your enclosures. And then you just say, like, make me a dinosaur. And sometimes it fails, too, and you just, like, are out the money and you just throw away the egg, I guess. But then you can make... The dinosaurs and you can also research improvements to the dinosaurs or alterations you can make them look different colors you can make them more aggressive which i never did because why are you going to make the dinosaurs <laughs> more aggressive <laughs> you could also make them live longer which is nice from a, a monetary perspective because the dinosaurs do die and then you got to airlift them out of there you like click on this helicopter and you're like okay get that dead dinosaur out of there mm -hmm. they like fly over it and crane it out um so if they live longer that's nice and you can make all sorts of different dinosaurs. You start out, I think the first one that you can do is Struthiomimus, hmm. which I think they just went as Gallimimus in the first Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. but it's definitely Struthiomimus in this game. And the dinosaurs all look very Jurassic Parky, so they stuck to the canon of Jurassic Park, although they used all real dinosaur names, I think. I haven't made Velociraptors yet, so I'm not sure if it's going to be the little feathery version or the big Jurassic <laughs> Park one. I'm guessing it's going to be the big Jurassic Park one. But the first dinosaur that you can make, I think, is Ceratosaurus. Or something. They picked an interesting one for 
carnivores at least mm. that you can make. And I was so worried about making this carnivore. I made like a whole separate enclosure really far from the herbivores. Oh, in case it attacks and yeah. eats everything. I waited until I got my upgraded electric fence <laughs> to put it in. And then I, I put, you can have these little evacuation shelters that you can have people hide in if there's a dinosaur escape or if there's like a hurricane comes by. And I put one right next to their <laughs> their viewing area so that everyone wouldn't have as far to run. And yeah, but I think the most fun part of the game is... When you're doing certain things with the dinosaurs, for example, you have to refill feeders and you can do the little goat feeder where it like pops a goat out, although it's not on a chain. So it just runs around in the enclosure and then the dinosaurs like track them down and eat them, (laughs) which is really fun. But you have to refill these feeders once in a while and you can either tell your little squad to go and do it or you can actually get first person into the Jeep and like drive into the enclosure and do it, which is kind of terrifying and super fun to do. Yeah. And you can also take pictures while you're in there. So sometimes it's like, I'm going to try to take a picture up close to this super aggressive dinosaur and not get eaten. Does it do a flash? I don't think so. I mean, it's like a dinosaur's attention. I mean, you get their attention just by being near them and they start kind of chasing you around. Sure. They haven't caught me yet. (laughs) I made a big enclosure partly for the sake of being able to drive around and try to lose it. (laughs) (laughs) But the Ceratosaurus isn't that fast. I don't know. Maybe the T Rex will be faster and it'll be harder to escape or the Indominus Rex because you can make both Indominus Rex and Indoraptor eventually too, Mm. which will be interesting. Oh, but as a T-Rex, maybe you just stay still. (laughs) Oh, good point. Yeah. And then it loses interest and Mm -hmm. goes away. Yeah, that'd be interesting. So the game's really fun so far though. I'm really enjoying it. There's actually five islands. You start on islands that no one's ever heard of that aren't really in the movies or the books. Mm -hmm. And then as you get farther through it, you unlock like the original Isla Sorna and all that good stuff. So... Yeah, I've only finished the basic island and just moved to the next island. I'm really excited to get to Isla Sorna, though. I wanted to get there so I could see all the Jurassic Parky bits. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming that you'll be able to repair some of the structures from Jurassic World because when you get to the second island, there's some stuff that's damaged that you can go repair. Oh, also what's really fun is if your dinosaurs escape, you can go first person in a helicopter and tranquilize them. <laughs> and then you call in a different helicopter to airlift them back into their enclosure. It's pretty fun. They put a lot of details into it that I wasn't expecting. I was expecting it to be more of just a simple park builder, but those couple of first-person details and some of the other aspects add an element of fun to it. Cool. And I know that you can get sabotaged, too, because one of the upgrades is, like, to try to reduce getting sabotaged, like Nedry. like Nedry, yeah, I was just thinking. (laughs) Yeah. Is there a character like Nedry in the in game not yet i mean you've got the security department the science department and the, like the business department and they all give you missions mm-hmm. and at one point the security department's like just let a dinosaur loose <laughs> because we want to practice our our protocols <laughs> and everybody else is like what <laughs> there's actually jeff goldblum did some voiceover work for the di- for the game mm-hmm. i think all the other characters are like just similar voice actors but he, at that point, is like, I don't like this guy anymore. Like, I used to think he was okay, but now I think he's crazy. That's funny. <laughs> True to his character. Yeah, it was pretty good. So I think it's probably worth playing. I'm not sure exactly what it costs now. I think I paid like 50 or 60 bucks for a pre-order of it, which might be a little bit high because it's mostly just a park building game. But if you get it on sale for maybe like 40 or 30 bucks, I think it's definitely worth it. I'm excited to make some of these more vicious dinosaurs. I'm really scared about them escaping, though. There's a little tab in your money making for money lost through lawsuits. And I know that's going to go up a lot when I make like the Indoraptor. <laughs> hmm. It's going to escape and kill a bunch of people. But you or Indominus. Yeah. Maybe even the Velociraptors. Maybe. They're good at escaping. Yeah, they find the weaknesses in the fences and all mm-hmm. that. Now that we're all Jurassic parked and Jurassic worlded up. Let's get into our interview with Glenn all about Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. And a little bit about Jurassic World and Jurassic Park 3. Yes, because he worked on those too. Yeah. And all of the dinosaurs. But also just so you know, we've edited it because we we got so into our conversation. (laughs) Yeah, we're talking for like an hour and a half. (laughs) And so if you are a patron, then you can get access to the full interview, the bonus content. Yep. So that's on our Patreon page. If you want the full unedited version, which will probably be twice to three times as long. (laughs) We just couldn't stop talking. There was just so much good stuff to talk about with all the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And now for our interview. 
Gary and I are here talking to Glenn McIntosh. We're very excited. Glenn has been in the film and animation industry for over 25 years. He's originally from Calgary in Canada, and he's lived all over the world as an artist. He's been working at Industrial Light and Magic since 1998 and has worked on a number of films, including Star Wars, Episodes 1 to 3, E.T., and Jurassic Park 3, and Jurassic World, and also Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. <laughs> And, oh, uh, Glenn and I, we got to meet back in January at the Science Through Narrative Symposium at the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology Conference in San Francisco. And he gave this amazing talk called Using Narrative Film Structure and Technique to Engage an Audience. And it was about how to captivate audience, whether for fiction or nonfiction. And he also shared some test footage of Jurassic World. So all really great stuff. We're really excited to have you here. Thanks, Glenn. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, great to be here. I guess we kind of have to jump right into Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Can you tell our listeners, what was your role in the film? Uh, I was the uh, co-animation supervisor, uh, along with uh, Jance Rubinchek. Uh, I was the uh, animation supervisor on set. Uh, So um, throughout uh, production, I had a chance to, uh, you know, work with the actors, uh, work with the, the director, work with the cameraman. And be on um, in a very similar way to uh, when I was the animation supervisor on Jurassic World. Uh, just to uh, it was really important uh, as to to like be there to give the actors uh, and the cameramen uh, as much information as possible as far as like the scale of the dinosaurs and the speed of the dinosaurs. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, Fallen Kingdom was that uh, J A was really supportive of the idea of uh, animatronics. And so there was a lot more animatronics in Fallen Kingdom that the actors were able to uh, react to. Mm -hmm. But when those weren't available, when the actions were like, you know, too dynamic or too fast, uh, we had a number of um, sort of techniques that we would use uh, on the first film, we had sort of those raptor helmets that I think mm-hmm. a lot of people saw. <laughs> I sort of sort of did a quick drawing to make sure that the pivot point of the the head was correct, so that it, it gave uh, the uh, Chris and uh, Bryce just uh, you know great eye lines, but it also made them react where they didn't know what the uh, performer was going to do in mm-hmm. the same way that you wouldn't know what. Um, you know, a 500 pound Bengal tiger right in front of you. With you. So <laughs> you, it, we got these like really great reactions from them. So then when it came time to do the animation, we're now able to like put uh, things that, that the animal is going to do to make their, their reactions look more authentic. And uh, as opposed to something that was sort of like uh, static and, and standing still, like you wouldn't move or react that way. Uh, the same way you would if there was an, uh, an animal that big, uh, that close to you. Uh, so <laughs> that was really Im- important to me. So like the the, um, the animatronics like provided a lot of that. A lot of that is driven by the the script. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in uh, the Collins uh, and, and Derek's new script, there were these like opportunities for for the animatronics to really uh, uh, shine, uh, s- such as, you know, blue on the operating table, mm-hmm. um, the T-Rex, the bl- taking blood from the T-Rex Hell where yeah. you're, you're not required to have the animal do gross movements or like, and big steps. Cause those are typically uh, very tricky to do, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, you can sort of uh, take advantage of, of the, and, uh, of, of the technology of what the animatronics was. I know that for the, the truck sequence, there was, uh, 10 of us underneath that truck. Uh, and I, uh, Neil Scanlon, uh, who's, whose team, uh, operated and created all the dinosaurs. He let me, uh, operate the nostrils for, uh, for blue for that sequence, which is a lot of fun, but I was also mic'd up and I would, uh, have an opportunity to sort of tell the other puppeteers, you know, like she's in shock, she's losing blood. Let's have her shake more. And mm-hmm. so it was like ref- refining that movement, you know, like it is, is the, the shaking too much can, you know, like let's tone it down a little bit or, what sort of extra movements can we get out of her tail? And and um, it was really fun and, and a, a way to sort of like help create the performance uh, there. And then uh, once you get back into the animation, you know, you're you're sort of building upon that performance with the CG. Yeah. That's awesome. I didn't even realize that whole scene was done with animatronics. That's really cool. Yeah, we had trouble telling the, like we knew <laughs> that there was CGI and puppetry and animatronic, but we had a hard time telling. Yeah, we were on the lookout, and I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, that's the, that was sort of uh, J.A.'s goal, is that the the there's a blending of technologies where you're you're not really sure what it is that you're looking at, and that was like the, the goal throughout. That was sort of the mandate throughout, is that you're always 
you know, like tricking the audience into like, you know, well, what am I looking at? And uh, by sort of blending those things where we would have like an animatronic blue, but a CGI, which where the pupil would dilate, oh. or we would have an extra little bit of movement in the tail, but the rest of blue is the animatronic. It's sort of like creating that suspension of disbelief that's that's like so important where the audience is so savvy now and everyone is like so good at picking up and realizing, OK, that's definitely CG or that's definitely a puppet. And so the, the goal was to constantly be like blending the technology. So you were just ultimately you just accepted the animal as, as being real and living. Yeah. Mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> <Great>. Thanks. <laughs> So I want to ask, because you brought up the T-Rex in the trailer, too, how much of that was a puppet? Because I couldn't tell on that one either. So the, the T-Rex, in the in, when they, they're getting the blood from it, that yeah. was uh, a, a good like majority of those shots is the animatronic. Oh, uh, wow. There's certain moments where uh, it switches to CG. Like there was a they tried to get the shot where like Chris leaps through the jaws mm-hmm. of, the, <laughs> of the animatronic. <laughs> But, you know, those as safe as the animatronics as the animatronics were, I mean, that puppet, the those teeth were like hard resin. Oh, so yeah. you, you could genuinely hurt yourself. Uh, and, you know, we didn't want to do that with our our main hero actor uh, <laughs> as, as, as game as he was to try it. It was one of those things where it's like, you know, it's it, we're we're going to get a better uh, like near miss moment if we can coordinate that uh, in post production as mm. far as like making the snap just barely miss them. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas there's like a lot of uh, takes that you could you could try, and it sort of harkened back to like the 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 classic filmmaking that that you know they, they did uh, before there was CG, and there was a scene that was uh, ultimately cut from the movie where. Uh, the Indoraptor was playing with a human skull. What? And he, <laughs> so there was a, he was a hum, and it was this very harsh chiaroscuro lighting where it was very, very dark. And there'd be these like hard shafts of light coming in through the cell. And then the skull would like bounce off the brick wall and land. And then this, the animatronic claws would come in and pull it back out of, into the shadows. Ooh. And uh, we tried that all morning long one di- one time where it was because the skull had to be thrown in a certain way where when it landed the eyeball uh, eye sockets had to be facing camera so mm-hmm. oh, you know wow. we went through you know take 15 take 16 <laughs> take 17 it's like no that's not working let's 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 have someone else try throwing it and then uh the there was a hole in the top of the skull and the whole idea was that the the uh indoraptor puts its claw from one of its uh, fingers into the hole and pulls the skull out of frame Mm. well it was as 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 good as those puppeteers were to try and coordinate that is with those movements and they're all trying to control this enormous arm was almost impossible i ended up like putting on a blue a black sock (laughs) over my arm to pretend like so that they would ultimately paint my hand out but i guided the claw down into the hole (laughs) uh, to pull it out so there was a lot of um uh, and the shot was all ultimately cut, but it, it just it sort of gave you me an impression of of the uh, the respect I have for how they did it back in the day, where you know you didn't have CG to go in and and easily fix it. Yeah. You know? so there's a lot of uh, trial and error when you when you're shooting those sh- those scenes. So then the the shots that did make it of the Indoraptor claw when it's going after, I guess both times in, to Maisie is that yes. is that CGI or is that animatronic? It's the animatronic uh, hand when it's reaching out for Maisie's uh, uh, originally when it's when its hand is coming between the the, the bars. Oh, that'd be so <laughs> freaky! Just just great, uh, touching her hair. Oh, it actually and, touches her hair. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there was a lot of of uh, you know rehearsals and back and forth, and you know it was you know too close, too far away. So just you know the same same sort of thing. Like, but but once you've got it you've got it. Like now it exists on film. You, you don't have to like, you know, shoot a ball and reference pass and start yeah. worrying about the, you know, the perfect, the lighting and how the, the light would hit the, the, um, the, the skin, the skin detail. It's all there in camera, which, which made it really exciting. Yeah. That makes me a lot more impressed with the actress who played Maisie backing up, knowing that there's this animatronic, like <laughs> giant claw about to come out and get you. <laughs> well, and it was so much fun, uh, to be like on set, uh, with these, uh, animatronics. Like I know that for like, when we had the truck set, we had blue, we'd done a lot of rehearsals. And when I was working with uh, Neil, I noticed that the, the, soles of the feet of blue were perfectly clean. And I said, can we get some fullers <laughs> or 
<laughs> and, you know, dirty it up. Like if, if you had grabbed an ostrich, you know, and, and, uh, tranquilized it, it you know, it, its feet would be really dirty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, he's like, oh yeah, absolutely. So, you know, went and like makeup people went and got some, you know, uh, a special kind of, uh, makeup dirt and they dirtied <laughs> up the soles of the feet and the underside of her. And the whole time I was like, geez, does J.A. want this? Like, I was like, oh, well, like, what if he shows up on set? And he's like, what did you guys do? <laughs> uh, but uh, luckily, I, you know, I sort of explained to him uh, what I was uh, going for. And he's like, yeah, no, this is great. That looks fantastic. Keep going. So that was uh, to have him sort of like double checking that stuff was great. But it was uh, little moments like that where you're constantly like trying to make it look more real. Like, and, and part of that is, is dirtying it up and, mm-hmm. you know, putting a lot of the environment on the animal, whether it's like, you know, dirt or grass or mud or uh, just all the things that you would see on, on a real animal. We looked at a lot of reference of uh, reptiles, like crocodiles and tortoises and stuff like that. So, But what was fun was Bryce uh, had her daughter on set. And so the, we're all underneath the stage getting ready to, you know, puppeteer this thing. <laughs> and Bryce was like, you know, come on, come on, look at the raptor. And uh, her daughter just was like, shook her head like, no, no way. I'm not going to hear that thing. <laughs> uh, it did look genuinely scary when, as soon as it started performing mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, we we're, everyone was under there coordinating the action. So it, it felt like, like, like a real animal, which was really cool. Yeah. Did you have to do a lot of practice beforehand before getting actually under blue or for any yeah. of these? Yeah. There was a lot of rehearsal time beforehand. Uh, I um, was had the opportunity when they were like putting together the like the Indoraptor. They had uh, the the amount of detail that Neil and his team had put into the was, was incredible. They had like the nictitating membrane that was all in camera. <laughs> wow. So I was like showing him how uh, like I had reference footage of a crocodile showing how like the the, the main eyelid opens and then the nictitating membrane pulls back. Ooh. And so it's sort of like a an offset motion it's they're not uh, right on top of each other mm-hmm. uh so uh it was just like looking at a lot of the the natural world uh and then like as soon as they they got it i mean it was amazing how quickly they were able to like turn around uh, iterations uh to create that performance yeah so we i think we guessed crocodile as a uh, some kind of reference for yeah, the raptor. yeah. but what, what especially were, with the teeth yeah what were your other reference animals well, the it's for for Indoraptor, it was uh, largely inspired by the Indominus, and I know that like I had the opportunity to help like design the Indominus, and and one thing that was um, we we wanted to you know it was very important to Colin to d- distinguish it from the T Rex because when they were going to have the final fight uh, in Main Street, mm-hmm. you you couldn't he didn't want it to be confusing as to well wait wait a minute which dinosaur is which <laughs> right yeah. so. Uh, so from a color point of view, she's sort of this gray silver color. Mm-hmm. And then I had sort of presented him with these different options where, you know, she could have her teeth, uh, hidden the same way the, the, the raptors have their teeth are covered by their lips. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could have it like a, uh, like a T-Rex where you just see the upper row of teeth. Uh, and then I had shown him a reference of a saltwater crocodile where you had the interlocking teeth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I thought that looked really menacing because the teeth were always being shown and always sort of in the same way you look at a saltwater crocodile, just always looks menacing because yeah. you always mm-hmm. see the teeth. Always and feel so, like you stay away. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the Indoraptor, uh, the teeth are a little more, um, they're a little thinner, but a little bit more, uh, like, um, like spikier, mm. something that you'd see in a garrel or that, that type of, um, crocodile. Mm-hmm. And so, but it was that same sort of interlocking quality that, uh, just made her look really, uh, menacing and, and scary. Yeah. Yeah. It does look very scary. <laughs> There's also, uh, one thing that, uh, was incorporated into both Indominus and the Indoraptors. If you'll notice, like the eye is angled slightly. Yeah, I did uh, notice that. So it, it's not parallel to the 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 angle of the head. It's it's angled down slightly, mm-hmm. uh, just to give it uh, more menace. Mm-hmm. And um, in the same way that like uh, there's the certain design of of animals in nature, they just look mean, even <laughs> though you know they're not you know, <laughs> acting mean. They just that's just because of their design. You know, like if you look at like a rattlesnake because of the its brow, mm-hmm. uh, it, it can't you know express uh, anger. It just, it looks mean all the time. Or <laughs> like, if you look like a, at an Eagle, it always looks really intense because yeah. of the brow edge. Yeah. Or if, and if we found that by just changing the angle of the head, because we couldn't, 
animate the brow, obviously, because it's sort of like the, 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 the head of a crocodile. So they don't really have expressive brow ridges like you would see on a dog or something. Mm-hmm. So uh, we want just by changing the angle of the head, we could, you know, make the uh, Indominus and the Endoraptor look more sinister in the same way that sort of that head down but looking up angle that uh, Kubrick uh, did in, in like a lot of his movies where you would mm-hmm. see like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, oh, Irvin yeah. Afrio in Full Metal Jacket, uh, or Alex in A Clockwork Orange. They all have this look where they sort of, their head is down, but the look is up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not really, uh, it's not overly expressive I- I- as far as anger goes, but it just, it gives the uh, a sense of, of malice and that uh, you could get uh, with the animal designs without making them too anthropomorphic, too, too human looking. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Really cool. Are there any other, I was wondering which other dinosaurs were animatronic. Are there others that we've missed? The, the tongue and the, uh, the beak on the Sinoceros. Oh, I was hoping that was real. That's great. <laughs> that is, uh, you know, there was when it's like trying to, it's just, it's just curious. It's just sort of like waking Chris up. Yeah. Uh, that was shot on location in Hawaii by uh, uh, Neil's team uh, and then replaced with uh, CG. But it was really important to like sort of have something there. Yeah. Uh, his reaction. Down. Yeah. So his reaction was great. So. I love that scene. That is a really fabulous yeah. scene. Yeah, and he really enjoyed uh, uh, performing that. You could, <laughs> he was, you could tell he was really into it you yeah. know, in, the, in the rehearsals where it was just an opportunity for him to just, you know, use his improvisational skills and also like, you know, he like the body language, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. which was really fun. Um, and the uh, uh, also like we had like sort of a, a, an in-between that wasn't necessarily um, an animatronic. It was like a balloon. Hmm. So uh, balloon isn't the right word. It was just sort of an inflatable head mm-hmm. that had the Maya uh, Indoraptor CG model mapped onto its surface. Oh, so no. it, you, could see, you could see the detail and the features on it. Mm-hmm. But it was a harness that was worn by uh, Liam and, and Aiden, their, their father and son. And they, they operated a lot of the aliens in, in Star Wars and <laughs> the new Star Wars films that Neil has done. And um, they w- we had a tail made as well because – what you found is that like you don't really get a sense of how enormous these creatures are until you put the tail in. Mm-hmm. And so it was a great guide for the the cameraman to be able to see like, holy cow, in order to frame this thing, I've got to like pull way back. Ah. And so it was also uh, a great guide for the actors, like when we would be in there with the tail and we would sort of approximate, you know, what the length of the torso would be in between. And then uh, you give you a real sense of just how long these animals are, mm-hmm. you know, like. Even Blue, when she's standing there, she's around 13, 14 feet long. So, you know, in the dinosaur world, she's she's not the biggest of dinosaurs. But then when you, you have uh, Blue's head like right there in front of you, you realize <laughs> the, tail, the tail is like 13 feet back. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if she turns, she's going to like swat, you know, and, you know, knock over all sorts of stuff that's that's behind her. So that was uh, something we were always uh, trying to be very conscious uh, conscious of. Yeah, that's really cool. So there was kind of like a one of those two people horse costumes with a big gap in between. Yes, yes exactly. But it, there was a big gap in between. And sometimes I would operate the tail and sometimes uh, uh, Liam and, and uh, Aiden would, would operate it. And, and uh, you, it, what was amazing was the subtlety of performance you could get, like where there were rods on either side that could control the head turns. Mm-hmm. So you could get these really finessed movements of sort of like these bird-like ticks to sort of... Uh, show which way she was, uh, which way she was looking. Mm. Um, and then for the, um, in the bunker, they, uh, went and built like a baryonyx head, like a one-to-one scale Hmm. representation in like gray resin. (laughs) And, uh, I I was holding that. So it was like 40 pounds of resin. (laughs) Oh my gosh. My head. And then there was a rope, uh, that I could control the jaw. So when Bryce and Justice were uh, being menaced by the uh, uh, Baryonyx, we actually had a, a full-size head representation uh, oh. uh, there. The one thing I had to be careful of was that the lava that was dropping down was you know, ultimately replaced by CG, but on set it was um, flaming kitty litter. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Someone figured out that kitty litter uh, on fire looks great on camera. <laughs> And so uh, we had fire marshals on set, and uh, when they would uh, drip it down, it looked fantastic. You'd have this like fire like uh, falling down through this grating, and then uh, they would say, "Okay, you can bring the head in here, 
or here, but not here, because this is where the fire is going to be falling. I'm like, okay, good, good safety tip. So. That's funny. Plus, I resin just, probably doesn't hold up to fire all that well. No, no, probably. <laughs> well, and the thing was is that I got so into the performance, uh, they had gone to all the trouble of, of you know, making this this amazing baryonyx head, and then I would be like rushing at the at the stairs that <laughs> they were crawling up, and I, you know, would smash the teeth off, and I felt. <laughs> bad because like after each take it'd be like they'd go and pick up the teeth <laughs> it was uh but it, they really it was really necessary to sort of give them the you know there's an urgency that they needed to uh get up that ladder yeah and so there was where i was trying to bring in uh this head as, as as fast as possible and then even when they were going up the ladder we shot an insert where um the uh justice's you know foot is like kicking down mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i was wearing my black sock on my hand and i was actually <laughs> grabbing uh his pant leg <laughs> and so it was a uh an opportunity where it was you, there my the jaw ultimately replaced my hand but it was almost like he was waiting for me to grab uh <laughs> his leg so mm-hmm. i said just just try and get up the stairs as fast as you can and and, and kick down if if you feel a tug and so there was a number of takes where uh, there where I'm, where I'm trying to I'm genuinely trying to like grab it. And then we ultimately got one where, you know, I grab I pulled his pant leg down hard and then he kicked really hard and then pulled himself up. But of course, he kicked me in the hand and <laughs> that, that kind of hurt. And then they went and looked at it on the camera and they're like, yeah, that looks good. And I'm like, good. <laughs> <laughs> no more. <laughs> Uh, but it, it was fine. It was, but it, it was, it was really fun to do, but it was like, it's, uh, you're an animation supervisor and then you're all of a sudden you're at Pinewood studios and you're in this, uh, mock-up of a, of a tube and you've got a black <laughs> sock and you're reaching up and grabbing, uh, a stunt man's leg. And, uh, you're like, wow, oh, this is a cool job. <laughs> yeah. That sounds awesome. really cool. Yeah. <laughs> we were, so we were trying to figure out if we knew all the dinosaurs that, or if we recognized all the dinosaurs in the movie, but there was one we we tried to figure out. Do you remember Garrett the lava scene? This mm. is after the Sinoceratops licks uh, Chris. Oh yeah, the skeleton that gets engulfed by lava. Do you know what that was? You know, it looked like some sort of notosaur. I um, I don't know specifically. I don't know if it was if I don't think it was specifically based on an ankylosaur because it didn't have the distinctive horn shapes yeah. of the head. Mm-hmm. But I I don't know. That's um, that's, that's what I was part. guessing too. I, I assume just based on what I'd seen at, at the the Royal Terrell that it was like a, some sort of type of notosaur, but uh, I couldn't uh, tell specifically. It might be kind of generic too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be. So, and what was a lot of fun was like after that, like that whole um, stampede sequence was you, you in the trailer that we had to deliver in December. Mm-hmm. You saw the Carnotaurus. And uh, mm-hmm. everyone was really excited because, you know, you finally got a chance to see a Carnotaurus in, mm-hmm. in a Jurassic film. But then, of course, in the trailer, they show that the T-Rex kills it. Yeah. <laughs> so you're like, uh, you, we were trying to uh, uh, sort of, uh-oh, the, now we've sort of established that, okay, it's it's not going to be as much of a threat to the heroes because we see the T-Rex get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in January, uh, the call came from uh, J.A. and uh, Colin and David Vickery just sort of like, well, what if? Like, could you, well, what if we have a, a fight right there? And we were all over that. We, we thought that was fantastic. Like, mm-hmm. you can't have enough dino fights in a Jurassic movie. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, it was an opportunity to sort of harken back to sort of the, the Ray Harryhausen um, battles that you'd oh, see. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, Ray Harryhausen actually had like a, a um, you know, Ceratosaur and an Allosaur and, and he had a Triceratops in, so, in uh, 1 million years BC. And so we had an opportunity to sort of, uh, do our version of uh, a Ray Harryhausen uh, battle, uh, and that was that was a lot of fun because uh, it was sort of a lot of that environment ultimately ended up being CG mm. because we didn't uh, know what sort of camera work we were going to need because we didn't know what sort of choreography we were going to have. Uh, so we uh, ultimately uh, Alex Wang and, and his, his team up in Vancouver like created these incredible. Uh, virtual environments to accommodate the the animation that we were doing, which was, you know, we would looked at reference of like bulls fighting. And hmm. um, I didn't want the fight to just be sort of snap and, and uh, jump back and snap and jump back. I wanted it to be more um, layered, like mm-hmm. they're trying to flip each other or they're uh, knocking each other down or they're kicking each other. And so like just coming up with a, a lot of really dynamic moves that you've, 
uh, you wouldn't expect that. Uh, so we on YouTube, it, it was a lot of fun uh, doing a lot of research, looking at animal fights, mm. <laughs> sort of like what kind of movements we could potentially incorporate. And the animators did an incredible job, yeah. sort of like in inspiration, like one of the movements back. It it might only be a second or two, but it was based on a on a uh, buffalo mm. and how yeah. buffalo reacts, and even like the. Uh, the T-Rex, uh, sort of the iconic shot that you always see in the trailers where it reacts to the volcano exploding. Mm-hmm. Uh, when the shockwave hits it, 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 it violently shakes its head. Yeah, uh, I like uh, that. Yeah, and uh, that was animated by Lee McNair, who is the associate animation supervisor. And uh, he had found reference of an, a bull elephant uh, being really mad at a, uh, a cameraman, <laughs> and violently shaking its head. And so we sort of reasoned that the the T-Rex would be, you know, annoyed by the shockwave. And so it would shake its head similarly. (laughs) So he incorporated that move uh, uh, into that. So it it was a lot of fun to sort of find these like moments to sort of like build into the performance of the dinosaurs so that they felt as real as possible. Definitely. Oh, how about that Brachiosaurus scene, though? The one where where the islands so exploded. Sad, that right? was, oh, got me every time. And we <laughs> saw it three times. <laughs> and th- there was a piece of uh, concept artwork that I had seen very early on that that was uh, uh, based on. And uh, it, it definitely, you know, harkened back to the fact that in the first Jurassic Park film, the first dinosaur we see, the first you know, dinosaur that instills the audience with wonder is the brachiosaur. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so to um, have it be the last dinosaur that you see on the island uh, and sort of uh, falling back into the fire and the smoke, it was, uh, uh, that was a very, there was a distinct moment that was very important to J.A. to, to uh, make it as emotional as possible that, uh, you know, this is what man has created, and now you're now you're seeing what the destruction of of the of that same dinosaur. So, it was, uh, it, you could hear a lot of people in in the audience uh, really sort of you could feel you feel how emotional it was for a lot mm-hmm. of them. Yeah, Sabrina so. was one of them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, good. Well, that's good. That's what movies are supposed to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there were a lot of new dinosaurs in this movie. I mean, you mentioned Carnotaurus is one of them, and, and Sinoceratops. Mm-hmm. Did, how much research did you do for creating all of these new dinosaurs in the movie? Well, the the I, what's interesting is that like across the board, the idea is that the animals are slowly starving. Oh. The uh, without without the humans being there to sort of control the feeding. Uh, they're sort of left to this uh, ecosystem and there aren't enough animals to kind of support uh, mm. that ecosystem. And so if you look at the Carnotaurus, uh, it's, it's a preorbital fenestra, that sort of that hole in front of its, its eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's sort of sunken in a little bit and that's deliberately done to sort of show that, you know, the animal is, is kind of starving. Mm. And across the board, if you, a lot of the dinosaurs had this sort of weathered quality to them and they were a little bit worn and, and uh, disheveled. And that was uh, sort of done to show that, you know, they were getting along fine, but, you know, as the volcano started to impact the environment, it was affecting, you know, the herbivores and then obviously the carnivores as well. Um, and what was interesting was that you didn't see any uh, parasaurolophuses um, in the stampede. Yes. But you did see them uh, at the end um, in sort of that it's coming out of the cages, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, but but not that many. And so uh, in my own mind, I had reasoned that uh, that was one of the ways the Mosasaur stayed alive was that <laughs> uh, the Parasaurolophuses were coming down to the water's edge to drink in the same way <laughs> wildebeest will come down to the water's edge to drink and then the crocodiles will get them. Well, that's the, the Mosasaur was surviving on Parasaurolophuses. So that's why... <laughs> In my mind, we didn't see as many of them, but uh, who knows if that's uh, if that's what Colin intended or not. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it made sense to me. So <laughs> the Stygi Moloch was great too. Yeah, yeah, that was a, a really fun character, uh, and and I had a chance to sort of like perform on set uh, with Chris and Bryce. Uh, they had made a resin head similar to what they had done with the Baryonyx, mm-hmm. and. Um, it, uh, those horns were genuinely sharp and, uh, I was afraid I was going to get too carried away with my performance and slip and get impaled on one of the horns. <laughs> oh, no. like, 
It was like a dinosaur statue collector, you know, killed by a dinosaur statue. I'd be like, <laughs> oh, the irony of that would have been terrible. But the, um, uh, it was uh, really fun to perform with because the, uh, uh, it's, it, we, had, we had, I had them put a, a handle at the back of it on. And so I, even though it, uh, it weighed a little bit, I could sort of uh, uh, shake the head. And uh, it, it gave Bryce and Chris something uh, to react to because you don't realize how big that head is until, mm-hmm. um, you know, you see it in front of you. So it was uh, a really like a fun character to sort of play with. And when it runs around the corner and escapes and the bucket comes flying out, there mm-hmm. was uh, I was behind that corner and i would get audio cues from the assistant director like okay throw the bucket and <laughs> did like, like 15 takes of like throwing the bucket and in, in different ways which was, uh, <laughs> that was the, another another like fun little uh, opportunity when you're being when you're on set yeah <laughs> <laughs> i liked the touch too when it did hit its head it kept having to kind of shake it off yeah <laughs> yeah, which was a lot of fun. Uh, there were look, um, uh, Jance and his team did a great job animating it. But I know, like, we looked at a lot of reference of like uh, uh, ibexes and you know goats and and rams. Like when they you know meet head like big big horn sheep when they meet head on, how they'll kind of like shake it off uh, <laughs> because of the the impact involved. And uh, so when it started like mowing people down at the auction, it uh, it was a lot of fun to sort of see them film that and have. All the uh, the stuntmen get uh, like all the stunt people were being ratcheted all over the place, which was <laughs> amazing to see. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, that was a good scene. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, I've got one more question. If somebody wanted to find out more about you and your work, where would the best place be for them to go? I I think if you go to ILM like the ILM website, there's a like a bio on me, and um, I'm going to be at Comic Con this year. I'm going to be at the Chronicle Collectibles booth. Cool. Oh, nice. Uh, and I'm going to be. Um, I was there last year doing uh, Dino sketches for the fans, hmm. uh, and I will be there again this year. And so, if anyone wants, you know, as a fan of the uh, Jurassic films, and they want like a, a Jurassic sketch, uh, I can certainly do one for them. The uh, and then I'll. I'm, I think I'll also have some pre-prepared sketches so that people won't have to wait too long. I could just, <laughs> uh, sign those. But, uh, but if, if someone wants a specific sketch, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to draw one up because I've been, uh, drawn for ever since I was a little boy. And, but now I've, I've got it down to a science after working <laughs> on, uh, on three of these films, uh, like with the, uh, and they're, they're, they're always, they're always fun to draw. And I always love people's requests too. You always, the, the kids are always like, well, why don't you have the T-Rex fighting the raptors with the Indominus? <laughs> <laughs> Just like, all of them. <laughs> this lineup of people behind you. are like, uh, well, why don't we limit it to one dinosaur? How about that? <laughs> they, it's always fun to hear uh, uh, their imaginations because they're always coming up with something like way cooler than you could ever think of. <laughs> uh, but yes, I will be at the Chronicle Collectibles booth and uh they're gonna have some uh, cool stuff this year as well so feel free to pop by and and uh uh see that stuff and uh just say hi it, i'm always uh, uh love meeting uh fans of the jurassic films as you can probably tell i uh, love dinosaurs as much as as you guys do and <laughs> uh, i love talking about all things dinosaurs so uh, uh feel free to pop by and and say hi or if yeah if you want to draw in let me know awesome, awesome. I think, uh, Garrett, we're going to have to find a way to get there. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I want a drawing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll make something happen for you guys. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm glad you uh, glad you like Fallen Kingdom. So, oh, yeah, it was oh, great. Yeah. Loved it. I loved the dinosaurs in it, especially. A couple of the characters were like, meh, but that wasn't your part. <laughs> Everything you did was golden. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you again, Glenn. We had such a great time. <laughs> and again, as a reminder, if you want to hear the full interview, then check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Yep. And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to... Uh, Give a big thank you to TRX Dinosaurs, our sponsor of this week's episode and creators of amazing dinosaur sculptures, animatronics, and puppets. Mm-hmm. 
As we've mentioned before, they make some really cool and unique creatures. Everything is custom made that they make, done with tools like knives and soldering irons and <laughs> faux fur for feathers, wires. You start with the knives. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got to cut the foam first. Yeah. That's step one. It's like Michelangelo. You start with the big block mm -hmm. and then you whittle it away. And the dinosaur comes out. Exactly. <laughs> and they're very good at making the dinosaur emerge from that foam. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Yeah, there's lots of examples of different theropods on their Instagram, but they are open to making anything, and anything you get is scientifically accurate, which is really cool. Yes. They also make some Jurassic Park-style dinosaurs. They One of the popular ones is the baby T-Rex, mm -hmm. Jurassic Park-style, as pretty much everybody saw in Jurassic Park, The Lost World, where... You know, they carry it back into the trailer. Oh, yeah, the baby. It's, it's a pretty great puppet. So obviously that one's a little bit more Jurassic Park style than some of the other dinosaurs because a real baby T-Rex is not very cute. <laughs> <laughs> As you may know, if you've followed the Nano Tyrannus debate, has kind of a narrow head, not like a big, wide, cute baby looking head. <laughs> With the big eyes, yeah. Yeah. Well, it might have had big eyes. It's kind of, I don't know. <laughs> But they definitely do tend to make more theropods at the moment because I guess those are just the popular ones. And on their website, too, they feature Deinonychus and Velociraptor and stuff like that pretty heavily. So I think that skews what people want. They also make for good puppets. They're easy to hold. And you, yeah, you can make them life-size, too. You can't make a life-size Brachiosaurus <laughs> <laughs> unless you're making a baby, obviously. Yeah, at least as a puppet. As a handheld puppet. Yeah, it's hard to get your <laughs> arm down that narrow little neck. <laughs> oh, I was thinking the life-size Brachiosaurus. You couldn't make it a hand puppet. Oh, true. Yeah. You could make it as an animatronic. You could. They might need to get a larger warehouse if you want a full-size Brachiosaurus animatronic. <laughs> but I bet they would jump at the opportunity if that's the kind of thing you're into. So if you're interested in getting any kind of dinosaur that you can imagine, head over to trxdinosaurs.com and fill out their form. You can also see everything they're working on on their Instagram at TRX Dinosaurs. Yep. So go to those places. Get a dinosaur. <laughs> look at dinosaurs. <laughs> All that stuff. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Llama Ceratops, which was a request from Philip via Patreon. So thank you. And as a quick reminder, we have over 80 dinosaur requests right now, which we do plan on getting to, but it will take mm, probably close to two years <laughs> since we do this show once a week. And so now we have closed our dinosaur requests to patrons only. If you are a patron, make a dinosaur request and we will get to it as soon as we can. Our current list we will get to, but we will be prioritizing Patreon requests from now on. Yeah, because it's just so many. Yes. <laughs> but if you are a patron, then you have access to our page on our website, which is password protected, to show you which dinosaurs have been requested. Yep. And therefore, which ones are coming up soon? Yes. Well, sort of. There's over 80, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's you have hard a 1 to... in 80 chance if you pick one off the list. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, back to Llama Ceratops. It was a Ceratopsian that lived in the late Cretaceous about 85 million years ago in what is now Mongolia, and it was probably small like other Mongolian Ceratopsians. Its name means Llama Horned Face, which <laughs> is pretty great. It's such a goofy name. <laughs> And it was found in the Nemec Valley. They found a partial skull and lower jaw. It was named in 2003 by V.R. Alifanov. The type species is Lamaceratops Tereshenkoi. And it was herbivorous. As you might have guessed, it's a ceratopsian. There's not enough fossils to know how big it was, but we may be able to guess based on Bagaceratops. Bagaceratops was a relative. It was roughly the size of a medium-sized dog, about one meter or three feet long and under 100 pounds. Not, and if you want to learn more about Bagaceratops, we talk about it in episode 72. And it was probably a pretty cute dinosaur. <laughs> There's your bias for the herbivores again. Yeah. Well, also because it was small. Yeah. <laughs> and it wouldn't try to eat me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I think if it had the one. opportunity, it would. Like if you were sleeping... Oh. They might try to munch on you. Oh, don't ruin it for me. Herbivores aren't as friendly as everybody thinks. <laughs> no, but I think it was would have been too small to munch on me. Anyway, <laughs> not everybody thinks that 
Lamaceratops is a valid genus. Some actually think the fossils found could be referred to Bagaceratops since the fossils for both are very similar. And also, Lamaceratops, maybe it's a new species of Bagaceratops, so there's some debate. But it is part of the family Bagaceratopsidae, which is a group of dinosaurs with parrot-like beaks that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Asia. And you're right, actually, that parrot-like beak could hurt if it's pecking yeah. on me. Yeah, for cropping vegetation or chunks of Sabrina. Oh, just me? <laughs> <laughs> just you. Because <laughs> you think it's cute, so you'll let your guard down, and then there goes a finger. I mean, not to travel back to the late Cretaceous. Yeah. Well, think about parrots. <laughs> And then think about a parrot that's like 10 times the size. Oh, that's true. Parrots yeah. don't like me. No, birds don't. Well, I mean, they like you, but you don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> and they know it. <laughs> <laughs> and our fun fact of the day is simply that some dinosaur fossils are radioactive. Ooh. I think we've mentioned this before because we saw some radioactive fossils when we were at the two medicine formation and the paleontologist we were with Corey and Dave busted out a Geiger counter and just showed us like, hey, look at this one. See the Geiger counter going? That's because it's radioactive, which is a really fun trick. And it could also be useful for sorting too, because then it's, you know, the other rocks aren't as radioactive. And this can happen because in fossilization, two things happen. For one, the calcium and other organic material in the bones gets slowly replaced by minerals in the surrounding rock, as most people are aware of, and it takes thousands and millions of years. On top of that, the voids in the bone can be filled with nearby minerals. So say, for example, you've got a large bone that has a hollow cavity in the middle. The rock from the surrounding area can just work its way into it and fill all that up, fill up all those spaces. So if there's any kind of radioactive material in the surrounding rock, it can end up in the bones. On top of that, Fossils sometimes even concentrate radioactive elements, like when they're drawing in these different minerals, sometimes it slightly favors radioactive elements a little bit. And then they can be more radioactive than the surrounding rock, and it can make it easier to actually pick out fossils. So there you go. Nice. They're not dangerous, though. Not that radioactive. Just a little bit. I guess it's possible, though. If there was one that was buried really close to like a, a little chunk of uranium, maybe you could have a fossil that was dangerously radioactive. Hmm. But I think usually uranium is spread out pretty dilutely and it has to be concentrated in those centrifuges and stuff. So it's, it seems like it probably wouldn't happen. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Maybe in like millions of years, an animal that gets buried near one of our current underground nuclear waste facilities will be super radioactive because mm. we've concentrated it and then the fossil might leach it out. But that's, a, that's another story. You could probably make a movie on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And check out our page at Patreon at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.